The other issue, which is, I talk a little about this in my book, that I think is very interesting, is the question to, to take a modern term and re read it back 150 years where it doesn't belong, but people have done it, a kind of black nationalism. What was the consciousness? Was it a race consciousness? I think the answer is no. I think that among African American voters, ordinary people, the, the, the notion of equal citizenship sort of transcended race in a way. You couldn't transcend race, it was everywhere. But people like, the, the classic example is Martin Delaney. Remember the abolitionist before the war, then emigrationist, nation within a nation, then civil war, soldier. And he comes down to South Carolina and he tries to get elected to office on a race platform. Do not vote for white people, do not vote for carpetbaggers, do not vote for scalawags, only blacks can represent blacks. Don't believe these school teachers, ministers from the north, they don't tell the truth. Remember that it was the black soldiers that, that freed the slaves, not Lincoln, etc. He gives you what, you know, this is a strand of African American thought all the way through, but he never gets elected to anything. And in fact, in one, you know, he writes this letter, I quote, to, the, to a black newspaper in the North complaining how ignorant the African Americans in South Carolina are because they don't see the necessity of just voting on a racial line. I went into the countryside and I received the angry rejoinder, he says, we don't want to hear that. We are all one color now. We are all one color. What they mean is in terms of rights. In terms of rights, we are all one color now. They believed that the Constitution had been, this is Delaney, had been purged of color by a radical Congress. So this, was, this is a moment when African Americans, in, you have this kind of odd tension. On the one hand, in their religious life, there's this separation into autonomous institutions. But in political life, the, pr the thrust is toward inclusion. It's not emigration. People are not saying, let's go to Africa, let's go to Central America, let's go to Haiti. No, that'll come back after Reconstruction. But now it's full inclusion as equal citizens of the new United, the, the United States whose constitution has been, quote, purged of color. But there's also a very practical element to this. They're smart enough to know that an all-black government is not going to get very far in this country. You must have white allies. It's not just a question of votes. It's a question of kind of respectability in the North. You need to have an interracial coalition. So that leads us to the question of what whites are willing to cooperate or take part in Reconstruction government along with the African American voters. And of course, the two groups we can we talk about are the first off are these carpetbaggers. Okay? Here's a carpet bag. <laughs> what is a carpet bag? It's a, it's a little valise, it's a little uh, backpack, except you carry it around. It's made out of carpeting. I mean, literally, that's it's sort of old carpeting. And that's what a carpet bag is. Okay? That's where the name comes from. The idea is. People, white people in the North, as many, you will find this phrase in many of these old books, put all their belongings into a carpet bag and went south. What are you trying to say if they put all their belongings into a carpet bag? Obviously, they didn't have all that much, unless they're carrying gold bullion around. In other words, it's not just that they're from the North, it's they're poor, they're the dregs of Northern society. They threw their few belongings into a carpet bag and went to the South. Why? To reap the spoils of office, to enrich themselves by manipulating the ignorant former slaves, okay? That's the image of the, uh, of the carpet baggers um, in the typical story. And as I've said, well, here's Bowers, the, you know, fanatical anti-Reconstruction. Left to themselves, the Negroes would have turned for leadership to local whites who knew them the best. This was the danger to Republicans. It was imperative they should be taught to hate, and teachers of hate were plentiful. The carpetbaggers are teachers of hate. They come down to try to set the blacks against their, they would have gone along with their former owners who knew them best, but the carpetbaggers kind of inter, intervene, insert themselves there. So they're poor, they're unscrupulous, they manipulate the black vote, to gain office. 
Now, carpetbagger is a political term, a purely political. It's not just geographical. White people who came to the South and aligned with the Democrats were not called carpetbaggers. Whites who had nothing to do with politics and maybe just went down to start up a business were not called carpetbaggers. You were a carpetbagger if you were a northerner who allied yourself with the Republican Party and defended the new constitutional rights of African Americans. Now, the largest group, and again, in the Janap book, there's a little essay or a little segment by, from Alexander White, a black, a, a carpetbagger white in Alabama, defending carpetbaggers. And he actually lays it out pretty clearly. Um, the largest group of these carpetbaggers were ex-soldiers. They, they were people who had been in the Union Army and stayed in the South when the Army was demobilized. Why did they stay in the South? Why not go back North? Because there was enormous economic, we're talking about 1865 now, there was enormous economic opportunity. The South was bankrupt. Cotton prices were high, very high. Um, there was need for outside capital. In 1865, Southern newspapers welcomed Northern investment, welcomed newcomers. Southern planters sought out partnerships with white new newcomers from the North because they needed money. They, someone who could invest with them in their plantation or even buy land from them. Um, that's by far the largest group. What does it tell us that they came to the South in 1865? It tells us that the idea they came to hold office is absurd or to manipulate the black vote. There was no black vote in 1865. There was no way of getting into office. Andrew Johnson had put the old planters back into power. They were not there for political purposes whatsoever. They were there for the same reason most people move from one place to another in this country, to try to better their condition in life and make a better living than where they were. Um, they were welcomed, as I said, by many uh, Southerners. Uh, many of them did buy up plantations. Some of them started other kind of businesses. Uh, they established real estate offices. Some of them were lawyers and tried to practice law. But these are a fairly small number of people, ultimately. There was no mass migration of Northerners. And nobody knows how many, but um, one book estimates maybe four or 5,000 Northerners in the whole South. In some places, like New Orleans, there were fewer Northerners in 1870 than there had been in 1860, according to the census, people born in the North. So it's not like a vast migration. Um, and because very quickly, the white Southern response turned from open arms to considerable hostility. This is even before voting, because these guys came down imbued with these free labor ideas. And they, many of them were idealists, and they said, you know, we want to show that we can grow cotton better, more effectively. We can treat these former slaves more equitably than the old planters. We understand what free labor is. Um, but most of them did not prosper, actually. For complicated reasons, the crops failed in 1865. There was the invasion of something called the army worm, which sort of like an early boll weevil, which ate a lot of the crops. The Mississippi River overflowed in 1865, 66, because the levees had all been damaged during the war. Um, and in fact, the amount of northern capital invested in the South was pretty small. If you were a northerner with money to spend, or a bank wanted to invest in 1865, where are you going to invest? You can invest in the South, where God knows what's going on. There's violence. Who knows who's going to run the government? There were tremendous opportunities in the West. That's where people who were solid, serious business people invested in the West. So little money. It, it's, now, it is true. Eventually, northern capital takes control of the South. But that doesn't happen until the 1880s and the 1890s, long after Reconstruction is ended and solid white supremacist governments are in place uh, in the South, and they know at least what is going on. So this business carpetbagger thing doesn't really materialize enough. Then there are also a few others, teachers, mission, religious missionaries, Freedmen's Bureau agents, people, idealists, who actually wanted to come down and you know, improve the life of the um, 
former slaves. There were some who were quite corrupt, no question about it. Henry Clay Warmoth, a former uh, army officer who became governor of Louisiana for a while, stole an enormous amount of money and enriched himself, but actually became quite popular among the whites. After he left office, he was a big sugar plantation owner now, and he got right into white society. Nobody seemed to bother much about him. Um, and then there were others. One of them, let's see if we can find him, Albion W. Uh, Turgi, Albion W. Turgi, who was a lawyer, came down to North Carolina, very important, helped to write the North Carolina Constitution of 1868, very progressive document. As a judge, fought the Ku Klux Klan in 1869 and 70 in North Carolina. And eventually, 30 years later, we'll get to this, in 1896, when a group of black leaders in uh, New Orleans decide to go to the Supreme Court to challenge the law mandating segregation in railroad cars in Louisiana, and they take the case of Homer Plessy all the way to the Supreme Court, this is who they hire as their lawyer, Albion W. Torgi, the ex carpetbagger who's now back in Chicago living there as a lawyer. And Torgi, we'll get to this, presents a brilliant argument about why Racial segregation is a violation of the 14th Amendment, but of course in Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court rejects his argument and man, you know, allows uh, racial segregation. Um, so my main point is that this old image about carpetbaggers as just adventurers, corrupt, is highly misleading to say the least. It's a, the unscrupulous exploiters of blacks. It's a political category. And it's highly, it's not unusual in 19th or even recent American history. Abraham Lincoln moved, right? From Kentucky to Indiana to Illinois. Stephen A. Douglas moved from Vermont to Illinois, got into public office. We in New York like carpetbaggers, right? We've had Hillary Clinton, who came here from God knows where, Arkansas, or wherever she was before she got here, got elected senator. Before her, Robert F. Kennedy bounced in from uh, Massachusetts somehow got himself elected senator, so we don't mind that in this state. We like people to come in.